So moving beyond simple experiments. So I think you can broadly split up experiments into kind of two categories. And this is a, a kind of different orientation that we heard about some in Beth Novick's talk. So on the one hand, among data scientists or inside of tech companies, you often see experiments where the goal is to optimize some quantity. So for example, at Facebook, they might be trying to optimize the amount of time you spend on the site. Um, at Spotify, they might be trying to optimize the chance that you will go from being a free customer to a subscriber. Often, the experiments that social scientists design are not designed to optimize anything. They're often designed to try to understand or pick out a particular mechanism. And so I think generally when you have one community that's doing one kind of thing and another community that's doing another, another kind of thing, this is sometimes creates a good opportunity. So if you tend to be in the understanding community, think, hey, what would it look like if I tried to design an experiment that was designed to optimize something? Like what kind of thing could we learn that way that we're, people aren't asking about now? Likewise, for people who are in the communities that are doing these things to try to optimize, what are ways that if we actually understand, we can potentially optimize better? So to give an example of this, you might, let's say you worked at the New York Times and you wanted to get people to subscribe to the New York Times. So you could try a bunch of different variations of text like, please subscribe, subscribe to help the New York Times, subscribe to support the New York Times, which searches for truth, blah, blah, blah. You can imagine writing a bunch of those, doing a contextual bandit, so it's like a complicated online experiment to see which one works better. But you're not actually building any understanding in that process, and it may be the case that there is an entirely different treatment that you haven't thought of yet uh, because you're not really understanding what's happening. So the way I like to think about it is these optimizing experiments, they can kind of get you to the top of the hill where you are. You know, if you can think of a local max, but they're very rarely going to get you to a completely different hill and which might actually have a higher peak. So whichever of these communities that you're in, I hope you'll be able to borrow some ideas from the other community. And ideally, in the best sense, we can do experiments that are doing both of these. And that's going to be particularly true if you want to deploy your experiments inside of a company or government. You're going to want to be doing both. Um, so a great example of an experiment that I think illustrates careful thinking about understanding and how that helps actually optimize is this paper about the constructive destructive and reconstructive power of social norms by Schultz. So they were interested in encouraging people to lower their energy consumption. And so what they did is they showed people their consumption relative to their efficient neighbors and relative to all of their neighbors. So how many of you actually get statements like this from your power company? Yeah, so this started, by the way, thinking of social science, this started in a paper in 2007 and the results were so impressive, companies were created to industrialize this treatment, and now it is widely deployed. So the amount of time it took from going from a paper to going to something that millions of people are receiving was actually quite short, um, in part because a lot of this is facilitated by digital infrastructure that the companies already have. So, um, this is the treatment, and so if you um, deliver this information to people about what they're consuming and what their neighbors are consuming, and then you measure how much electricity they consume one week later and three weeks later, this is what you get. So this treatment appears to have no effect at all on how people consume their electricity. Fortunately, um, these researchers were more clever and more thoughtful about what might be happening. And so they had this idea that actually what looks like a null effect is actually a combination of two different effects that are offsetting each other. And so if you split this out, what you see is that 
people who were using more than average, they lowered their energy consumption to be closer to their peers. But people who were using more than average, and people who are using less than average actually increase their consumption. So it's like, oh, I'm using less electricity. I should start using more, um, which I never would have thought people would do. But that's what they did. Um, but these researchers were much smarter than me. And so they anticipated this. And they also created a condition where they added this um, smiley face here. And so basically, they said, in addition, this, the information, they called it a descriptive norm. And the smiley face, they called it a proscriptive norm, sort of teaching people what they think is the right thing to be doing. And when you add this smiley face right here, you're able to eliminate a lot of this boomerang effect, where the low energy people start to use more. And so you're able to take an experiment that seems to have no effect, and you're able to turn it into something that has the effect that you want. So by thinking carefully about heterogeneity and thinking carefully about mechanisms, you're able to come up with a treatment that's actually really useful. Now, I just want to go back to this. You are not going to get this idea of the smiley faces through brute force, right? So if you were going to do an optimal, if you, let's say some of you have done an internship at Facebook, you might think, oh, let's like change the colors on those bars. Let's change the size of that font. Like all of those things are potentially going to give you small incremental improvements. And that is true. That's great. You should want those small incremental improvements. But in this case, thinking more about heterogeneity and mechanisms allowed us to get a much bigger improvement. OK. So if you want to move beyond these simple experiments, I think you want to think about these kind of three ideas, validity, heterogeneity of treatment effects, and mechanisms. So I talked a little bit about heterogeneity of treatment effects there. We see the same treatment has a different effect on different people as a function of their pre-existing characteristics. Mechanism is hard to define, actually, but it's kind of like the process through which uh, the treatment leads to a certain effect. So if you were going to say limes prevent scurvy, the mechanism is vitamin C. So oftentimes, we can measure that a treatment has an effect without understanding the mechanism. Um, but ideally, if we understand the mechanism, then we can sometimes like amp up that mechanism and design treatments that really focus on that mechanism even more. So validity, um, I think of validity as a useful kind of checklist to think about what a result is and communicate your concerns. And as you're designing your own experiments, think about how you can address each of these concerns. So statistical conclusion validity is like, did you do your statistics correctly? Internal validity is like, did the people, in, did the randomization work correctly? Was a treatment delivered correctly? These can actually be real problems in online experiments. Those are very, very easy to mess up. And so if you're evaluating an online experiment, if it has 50 million people in it, if they screwed up the randomization or people in the control group got the treatment, it doesn't matter that there's 50 million people in it. It's a messed up experiment. Uh, construct validity is an important idea of often when we create, like in this case, they're thinking was about descriptive norms and proscriptive norms. And the treatment is this. So like, is the treatment really operationalizing your theoretical construct? This is often very hard to do. This makes the most sense in these kinds of understanding experiments. So if you're just trying to like find the shade of blue that maximizes click-throughs, there's no real issue with construct validity. But if you're trying to have an experiment that's designed to yield understanding, you have to make sure that what you're doing and your theories are linked together correctly. Um, so one thing I like to do um, is always go back and forth between these two views. So sometimes I try to only think about it abstractly. And then other times I like to think about it only what the person actually did. And if what the person says they did abstractly and what the person actually did feel really different, then that's like a sign to me that there's some kind of construct validity problem. Um, external validity is also very hard to define well, but it often means 
that people think that the results might not be the same if you did it somewhere else with different people in a different setting. Um, this often, I've seen people debate about this in rooms without any evidence. And I think one of the great things about these digital experiments is that you can just do it. External validity is an empirical question, not a question that a reviewer should just speculate about. And so like, let's just do the experiment with different people or in a different setting and see what happens. And be, if the cost of experiments comes way down, then it's much easier to do that. So um, heterogeneous treatment effects. So in experiments, in digital experiments, there are often many more people than there are in lab experiments. And we often have lots of pretreatment information about those people. So if you think about Facebook, if you're running an experiment on Facebook, you know tons of information about those people. And so the traditional lab experiments tend to treat people like widgets. They just treat them all as indistinguishable. And if you have lots of people and lots of pretreatment information, you don't want to treat people like widgets. It's just wasting information. And you're potentially missing important and interesting scientific findings. Um, just to be clear, heterogeneity of treatment effects is also an area where you can have phishing and p-hacking. So you can like look through your experiment and say, oh, it worked well for men. Did it work well for men and not women? Oh, did it work well for 18 to 24 year old men or whatever? So you want to think about some of the things Justin Grimmer talked about, a pre-analysis plan or splitting up a, um, a uh, training set and a test set. And there are lots of new methods being developed to work in this. Uh, Justin Grimmer, for example, has some methods in this area. There are others as well. So mechanisms is the last idea. It's not as easy. I said, oh, it's like scurvy and limes, and the mechanism is vitamin C. And for those of you who have actually tried to isolate a mechanism, you know it's not that easy. Um, I think this paper by Don Green and colleagues does a great job of illustrating why it's not that easy. So I just want to say mechanisms are important, but they are hard. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to do that. Um, there are now experimental designs specifically designed to test mechanisms. I see some smiles. This is not, I don't mean to suggest that this is a solution to the problem. This is at, at the minimum, it's a step forward and a clarification of what some of the issues are, I think. Um, so again, I think if you focus on mechanisms, if you focus particularly on mechanisms and heterogeneity of treatment effects, those are areas where optimizing experiments and understanding experiments share goals. And so if you can see those kinds of problems, then you will potentially be able to partner with companies and governments, which will allow you to run experiments that you could not run otherwise. Uh, so are there any questions um, about moving beyond simple experiments? Jared. Oh, can we, Tom, can we pass the mic? Uh, how important is it to use pretreatment information? Um, the idea that I'm familiar with in uh, experimental design is if you randomize successfully, you actually don't need to know anything about the people because the difference will presumably be due to the condition. That's true. So if you randomize successfully, you don't need to know anything about the people. If you have that pretreatment information, though, you can do something called blocking, which allows you to be able to randomize better than random. So sort of somewhat in the same way that we raised, I had you all raise your hand if you had ever done an experiment on MTurk, and then we counted off and raise your hand if you've ever done a survey. And that made sure that each of the teams were more similar in composition than might happen randomly. Basically, blocking allows you to potentially remove some bad assignments where there's imbalance. Um, and then second is, even if the groups are balanced, it's sometimes the case that you might want to know, let's ignore the problems of overfishing for a second. Uh, let's say I could tell you, you run a big experiment, and then you automatically find the subgroups where the treatment effect is the biggest, and the treatment effect is the smallest. That would be cool. And you could do that even if you do simple random sampling, right? So I think the pretreatment information is helpful for one in the design stage in terms of blocking, and two in the analysis stage in terms of finding interesting heterogeneity, given that you're careful about uh, the fishing problem. 
So is, is it true that like blocked randomization is very similar to like stratified random sampling and survey design? Yep, exactly. Got it. Can you give an example? Of, um, so usually when you run experiments uh, in social sciences for trying to develop understanding, can you give an example of how to pull more from optimization and designing uh, social science experiments? Um, it's hard. So I guess what I would say is um, I don't have a ton of great examples, but let me try to illustrate, give some hypothetical ideas. So if I was very interested in, let's say, the effect of fear on people's attitudes towards immigration or something like that, um, I could imagine trying to find hundreds of different stimuli and trying to say, I want to find the stimuli that creates the most fear for a given person so that I can find this, find a treatment effect as big as I can. So that's like more in the, I guess that would be more in the design stage of the experiment. Like as you think about setting something up, um, finding stimuli that are more, allow you to probe the thing that you want to probe. Um, I think it could also be in terms of how you frame your question. So let's go back to the descriptive, proscriptive norms and energy question. So as a researcher, you could start off by saying, I want to study descriptive and proscriptive norms. Uh, or you could start off saying, I want to reduce people's energy consumption. And I guess what I'm speculating is that if you say, I want to reduce people's energy consumption, that's going to lead you down a different road. And that road could turn out to be fruitful for revealing new kinds of mechanisms or approaching existing mechanisms in new ways. But that's purely a speculation. external validity, so I feel like you might be a bit blasé about this. So yes. My Twitter bot experiments that we talked about earlier Yes. Um, I've tried to replicate them. Yep. Um, and it's not possible in the sense that Twitter is now different. It yep. can suspend your accounts if you try to do it. So I was wondering how, what you think about um, how we should think about digital experiments on platforms that can change in infinitely many ways that we can't measure. Yep. So I like the stuff you're doing about like validity and time. I don't remember what you call it. Temporal validity. Temporal validity. So let me, one of the things I like to do in any online experiment uh, is I think it should say exactly the dates that the data is collected. Like a very simple thing. Like when exactly did this happen? Because if you say, oh, I did an experiment on Twitter and I published the paper in 2019, like Twitter in 2018 and Twitter in 2017 are actually pretty different. And Twitter in 2018 and 2013 are really different. And so um, I think at a minimum what you want to do is say exactly when the data collection happened. Um, and more generally, I think it's great for us to see to what extent um, we can run the same thing over time in the same platform Sometimes the platform itself, the rules of the platform stay the same. So you could do it, but the norms in the platform change. So the effects might change. I think that's interesting. Um, yep. Uh, this isn't so much a question as just the um, information sharing, and I'm sure there are lots of people who have done experiments, so they already know this, but um, sometimes more you, uh, like using mTurkers, for instance, we might not have their pretreatment yep. uh, variables ahead of time, so we collect that information. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to think about when you collect that information when you're doing an experiment. And so if you're doing social science research, sometimes, um, especially if it's about attitudes, you know, even if it's not, uh, you know, um, I don't know, but if it's about attitudes, you might actually end up affecting some of your 
pretreatment variables mm -hmm. what people say and so mm -hmm. I ran into this um, problem when I was piloting my study and I collected all of my demographic information after my um, participants had been um, exposed to various messages about immigrants and uh. I realized that in certain conditions I was having like lower than expected um, Republicans versus uh, independents and what became obvious was that my um, my prime was changing these like independence Republicans to identify as Republican or identify as independent huh. because some things aren't that stable. Political identification is actually kind of movable depending on the thing that you're talking about. So then I had to realize, well, I have to put some of my demographic questions up front so that I can control on that later because if it's um, after the prime, mm -hmm. then I have to now take into consideration that my prime might have actually affected what they said about the Themselves. And I'm not the only person who's run into this issue. Um, other researchers have also encountered things like that. So being really careful about your placement mm -hmm. of your demographic questions and how even your demographic questions could affect your treatment, right? So yeah. I didn't put my race mm -hmm. questions up front because I'm interested in racial attitudes. Yeah. Um, and so that goes to the back because people aren't really changing their racial identification, for instance, but they might change like how liberal or conservative they think that they are. So just keeping that in mind yep. in survey, uh, in, um, research design. So yeah, so if you put your question, the demographics at the beginning, there's a possible problem. If you put the demographics at the end, there's a possible problem. I'm wondering if people have experience of not putting the demographics in at all and somehow linking that information from other data sources. So, for example, if you see the same Turkers over and over and over again, you don't need to collect that information every time. Or if you could somehow link them to their information in Facebook or some other platform. Um, have people done that? Has anyone done that? Oh, good. OK, so if you're interested in talking about getting demographics uh, for people on these Twitter, uh, not Twitter, uh, Turk-like platforms, maybe that's a good thing to talk about at the coffee break. Yeah, Jay? I, I have a question about externality and also causal mechanism, like mediation mm -hmm. or, modera or moderation. So to me, there is a kind of collective action problem in social sciences, maybe in all, only in political science. So, so problem for externality is like you need to have multiple study, not only one study. Like if you have just single shot and from one period, one population, it's kind of how they generalize your findings. So you need to do follow-up study, and for the same problem for the causal monkeys. If you want to do moderation or mediation, you need to have a large enough population size. Otherwise, if you're just subsetting data, it's kind of hard to get you know power for doing analysis. So one way you can solve the problem is like if you have same interest among the uh, different groups of uh, researchers. You can put together your resources and time and doing like doing multiple study for the same project and uh, publishing a paper saying like there are ten studies uh, multi uh, replicating the same finding or different locations, different time, and we have like a large set data set so we can do multiple kind of things, moderation, mediation, and so on. But sometimes I see some papers doing that, but like it's not kind of very widespread phenomenon in mean, political science. So I wonder. I mean, I think it's kind of good model, but somehow it's not doesn't scale up. So I wonder what's the, what's the reason for that, well, with, why you think it's not working, why well, it's not a good model. Oh, so I agree with you that, um, so I agree with you that we really want to see the same experiment run multiple times or slight variations of it run multiple times. Um, I think why the team model doesn't work very well is that it's very hard to do. So having organized a mass collaboration, I can tell you that it's a lot of work. And it's not the work that we usually think of ourselves as doing. Um, but I would encourage us to think that our job is not to um, write as many papers as possible, but it's to learn as much as possible. And so if this is the design that allows us to learn as much as possible, then maybe that is how we should think about what we should be doing. Um, I think one other solution to this problem, other than collaborating with many different teams of scientists, which I think for a variety of reasons is hard, is potentially teaming up with a company which allows you to deploy at a much larger scale. So after 
the experiment about the norms and the um, power usage. So this company called O Power started deploying that experiment at a massive scale. And an economist named Hunt Alcott, and maybe some other people too, teamed up with this company, O Power. And so they ran that experiment that, hap that you saw, they ran it like 100 times uh, in a bunch of different cities, in a bunch of different years. And so they were able to find some in very interesting stuff about um, this sort of, you could call it the external validity of the finding, or I would call it the heterogeneity of the finding. So just to give an example, one thing they found was that as time went on, the size of the effect got smaller. And so that you might think that has something to do with people's changing attitudes about the environment. But they actually think it had to do with which power companies deployed this experiment first. So power companies in areas where there are a lot of consumers that are concerned about the environment were some of the first companies to adopt this particular treatment. And so they got a larger effect. And as the treatment got moved out towards places where consumers were less concerned about energy, the size went away. So I think that's like a great example of seeing often when researchers try to do their first field experiment, they try to pick a setting where it will work. Like I don't know of any researcher who's about to deploy a big, expensive, complicated field experiment who is not thinking, where is the place that this experiment is most likely to be successful? I mean, if you know of someone who's not thought that, please let me know. And so then I think any first paper is likely to be a kind of high estimate if you think of the set of all possible settings where an, something could be deployed. Because the researcher often knows the most or has the best idea of where it will be successful. Um, so I think, again, by partnering with companies, I think we can see lots of replications or by partnering with lots of other academics. And it's a question of kind of for certain kinds of problems, uh, one of those approaches will probably be easier.